Okay. I got 72 minutes to film it before my veterans out, but we don't we won't be in here quite that long. Almost but not quite. What what? This is the 41 T E. And where is Brian Adams? Is Brian Adams at the truck? Is that Zach? Brian and Zach, get in here. Come on. Come on, boy. 401 TE, that's a fairly easy schematic to read right there. Uh, tell me what you see. See the franchise mission. Okay, how does the uh, how's the connection made? Uh, tell me how the connection is made on this one between the transmission and the final drive. This is going out to the CV axle. There's your spider gears. So how does what's going on in here make it out here? No chain. Not on this one. This is kind of an unusual transaxle in that regard. You notice on the back you've got two gears that are matched. This one here, it's got one to one. And there's a shaft going forward, and that's where your final drive is right there. So what you're seeing here is actually right there. Um, and in the final drive, these gears right here, uh, unlike the Toyota one out there, they're, they're all, they're all swimming in the same hole and all that. So basically, there's what you call a line diagram. Now, this line diagram is what most of your transmission mechanics like to use when they're building a transmission. They like to have a line diagram with all that stuff laid out so that they can piece by piece stack it all together. And they pay particular attention to the little seals and every little piece is in between there. You know, all the spinning parts are going to have a bushing or a bearing in between them, like you're seeing right here. And so I had one guy that was building a transmission in there one time, must have been 12, 10, 12, 13 years ago. And whenever he took the transmission apart, uh, one of the needle bearings wasn't there because it had come apart and was gone. And so he didn't put another one back because there wasn't one in there. And he kept having trouble until he finally I directed him to go to the line diagram and find that he had left, there was a part missing. He didn't take it out, so he didn't put it back in. First transmission I ever tore apart was out of a 78 or 9 Dodge, and I tore it all apart. And somebody came by and took one of the rubber seals out of one of the drums, just came by because he knew a little something about transmission. They put one there, and because I didn't take it out, I didn't put it back. I mean, I should have known there was supposed to be one in there, I guess. But at the time, I was just doing it like a puzzle. And when I put it back together, it pulled just fine until it got hot. And then that fluid get thin and start leaking past that thing. Anyway, there's your valve body. That's what a uh, fairly simple little valve body, because most of what's going on in this one takes place in this sucker. This valve body here. And the cool thing about this transaxle here, this valve body is hanging on the outside of the transaxle, and it's really easy to change. Now, it costs about $200, 200 to $250. But a lot of the times you'll get a code that uh, means there's something wrong with it. You have to replace that. And we've replaced several of them. You know, I got a bunch of them laying around here. Uh, but since these valves are doing so much, then there's not a whole lot that's going on in here. Uh, so uh, that little valve right there, that little teeny tiny valve right there, is the one that uh, caused us to have to get another valve body for this Dodge when he was first working on that. But that's another thing. All right, right here, look at all these here ports. We got line pressure, we got low reverse pressure, we got an accumulator vent, we got from the cooler, kick down apply, kick down release, front clutch. And this goes to the cooler too. And there's your kick down band adjustment screw right there. And you can see the band adjustment screw right there. Now these gears right here, the governor pressure below the differential cover on the right side, that's where the port is for that. And then this is a sort of an old picture of it because that old transmission range sensor is one from bygone years. It's just got those three terminals on it and all that. So this is just sort of like an overview of it. And that is not even on some of your new rules. Right? And that's an exploded view of it there. Now you can kind of see how this thing right here is driving. See, there's your uh, differential, your in here and your pinion. And you see that like the little output uh, speed sensor there. And this one right here has actually got a, looks like a picture with an oil filter on it. There's your transmission range sensor on that particular one. Uh, so this is sort of a, you know, generic thing too. Planetary gears down here, you know, whatever. All right, so the build date of the transaxle 
you might need it if you're referring to TSBs or order replacement parts. And the way that you break that down, K is Kokomo Transmission Plant. The last three digits of the part number is your is the next one. And then you, your bill date is going to be here. And then your bill sequence number is going to be there. And if you, have the, if you have this number right here and you give it to the parts people, they'll typically be able to give you whatever information you need. And what kind of pump is this? Can somebody identify the kind of pump that we got here? What type of pump is there? Three of our, three basic kinds of transmission oil pumps, and this is only one of the three. One of the what is this one and one of the other two? Anybody can do that? This is a verbal pop test. So I have the word sun in No. No, I mean this is actually make the pump oil. You got an outside gear, you got an inside gear, and you got a crescent in between them that's fixed. Pump. Yeah, and then you've got a vein pump, and then you've got a gerotor pump, which is the outer ring on this thing is busted, but it's kind of like that one right there. That's a gerotor pump. It didn't have a crescent. And that's actually an engine oil pump out of a Ford Escort. Somebody busted one and put a motor back together in the trailer part. Uh, but anyway, there's the other part. Whenever you take that off, that exposes the pump and all that. And here's your valve body it's kind of broke down here, like we were showing. This is that solenoid pack I just holding in my hand a minute ago. Then you got your little solenoids and there's another little solenoid in there. And so on and so forth. That's a, you know what you call that part right there that, that snaps across those descent, detents when you're putting it in gear? Remember what you call that? The rooster. Rooster cone. Yeah, that was what we were talking I was telling you and him about that. You know, the looks on their face whenever they had that transmission halfway back together. And I said, we're going to put this thing in a truck and see if it'll pull. And they were like, oh, maybe we need to take it apart and make sure it's a little cleaner. <laughs> All right, that's your rear analysis uh, assembly. You know. And it's got a little planetary in it. All the time. Um, this is going to move here. Look at the spines. The spines on the carrier, carrier are induction heat treated. That means it makes, them hot, it makes them harder. How many of you guys have ever been drilling something out, like a manifold drilling out a bolt or something? And whenever you drill a little ways, uh, the drill bit and whatever you're drilling starts to get a little hot. And then you'll notice as you're drilling it that not only has it started to get hot, but what you're drilling has started to get hard. The drill bit gets a little softer, what you're drilling gets a little harder, and your drilling stops. There's no more drilling going on. Have you had that happen? Yeah. That's annoying as all get out, isn't it? Yeah. How do you prevent that? That helps. What else can you do? I mean, the wall is not a bad idea, don't get me wrong. It's always good to have some kind of tap magic or something drill, like that you can put on it. Drill slower. The drill needs to drill slower. And slower but what, what, let me ask you this. What if you've already gone to the point to where what you're drilling is really, really hard and your drill bit won't cut it and now it dulls every new drill bit you're trying to drill it with? Portion. Huh? It's a bigger drill bit. Portion. Portion. What? Torch it. Torch it. Good idea. You torch it, you let it cool off, you've annealed it. Right? And so basically, if you heat it up slowly like that, you're tempering it. And that's what they were talking about with you and these. And you temper those. That's not a very good feature, obviously. Uh, the rear carrier features a five pinion design that helps uh, with, with the strength. If it's got five pinions, it's going to be stronger, right? That's not too hard. And you got your old and new style needle bearings, respectively. They got slightly different types, they're not interchangeable. Be careful if you got older parts going to do it. There's your transmission range sensor. We'll talk a little more about that later. Now let's look at our fluid map right here. Okay, we're in park or neutral, speed under eight miles an hour. Obviously, if you're in park, you're not going to be going eight miles an hour, but you could be going eight miles an hour in neutral, right? If you're rolling down a hill. All right, now you see this low reverse switch, right? And this is the application of that drum up there. And look how your fluid's going. Your manual valve down here is basically in the position where you're going to be in. And those right here is telling you what position you're in. Right? So when you move it around, this is your your pump is actually pushing fluid here. And it's going up there and pushing that little check ball out of the way there. And going up there to that low reverse switch. Some of if some of your scan tools are goofy, they'll call it a left rear switch, because they don't know what LR stands for. Uh, then it's going past this valve right here. And down there you see how it goes. Now look here, this is land pressure, converter clutch off, converter clutch on, residual, lube, and suction. All right, so land pressure is basically the dark color. And that's the one you're paying the most attention to. You notice there's lube pressure too, that basically is just keeping everything lubricated. That's right, see that right there? That's what that lube pressure looks like. Um, so anyway, 
and there's a very little. All right, now we're going to shift uh, right here. We got neutral speed over eight miles an hour. There's a slight bit of difference here. See, before we were in par, uh, but there's a little bit of difference here. And you notice we're not getting anything to our low reverse switch, and it's moved back over here. And see, that drum's not charged up and all that. That you hit is over there. Temperature sensor, you know, is measuring that. But you notice how your fluid is being driven over here, your solenoid switch valve right there. All right, let me go here again. Now then, we've shifted in reverse. Notice our low reverse switch valve has moved over here. All right, and so basically, we're, either our manual valve has moved and it's letting fluid go up here, and it's applying that particular you know, low reverse drum. And you got your low reverse solenoid right there, and then there you underdrive thing as your vent reservoir. This right here, you can basically tell, and see there's your reverse too. If you do, if you get to the point of where you can look at these and understand what you're looking at, and you've got a problem in a particular gear, this will take you a long way. Uh, you don't have any solenoids energized right there at this point. You see that right there? All right. Now we're energizing that solenoid right there. We've moved it, we're still in reverse, uh, reverse block, basically. We've thrown it in reverse driving down the road is what we've done. Uh, nothing is making it to the reverse, I mean to the uh, low reverse drum is disengaged even though you got that one powered up. It's not going to let anything go there. So that's your reverse block. You shift your reverse with speed over eight miles an hour, it keeps it from going in the reverse. But you don't want to tear things up. There used to be, from what I was told, this a salesman on these Cadillacs back in the late 60s and he would show how tough the transmission was on a Cadillac by going 60, 70 miles an hour and throw it in reverse and it would just burn the tires and talk about showing how tough the transmission was. And the, if a customer would buy that after a guy did it, it was crazy. But this guy that worked at the Cadillac dealer said after they put radial tires on the cars and you put it in reverse, not only did it tear the car up, but it was enough of a stop to where it caused some serious physical damage to the people inside the car. Obviously, they didn't have airbags or anything. Yet. And I don't think they were wearing seat belts either. You know. um, but, um, but anyway, now we've moved, now we've shifted to low gear. We're in drive, and we're basically in here. We got a low reverse, you know, and that one there. Those solenoids are energized. Those two, click, click, and they're they're in this solenoid thing. And see what's going on here. Uh, you got your underdrive in, and low reverses, and low reverse switch is moved over here. See, and the pressure's driven it over that way. And basically, because depending on which way it's coming from, that switch is going to move back and forth. See, it, it's not spring loaded or anything. It's totally driven by fluid pressure. And it always moves. And so you can follow these. Like I say, pay attention to that. And uh, there's your converter clutch. You know, not got enough pressure to do anything there yet. But anyway, uh, it can take a long time. You can talk about that a while. But the fact that they've gone to the trouble to draw this out for you to look at, you see? All right, now let's, uh, we're going to go on up to, uh, we're still in drive, and we're in second gear. All right, and you can look at all these little things right here and tell what we're looking at. Okay, now let's change in second gear. And we got that one energized, and we got your 2 4. That's the one uh, that was causing the chattering problem whenever Jonathan first put that transmission back together. The first time. And whenever it would chatter going from first to second, but it would like that. See, this we were going into this gear, and you notice that particular one was the one that's applied in there. And what had happened in there, you know how you got to rattle those clutches, I mean, rattle those uh, splines down in there to get into those inside pieces? Uh, what he had done was he managed to bend one of them. I mean, all of the teeth were lined up with their, you know, where they were supposed to go between, and it had bent it and made it shape like a diaphragm. And that's why the thing was chattering when it went in here. I mean, I had never really mentioned that to anybody before in here, but that's what that's what happened, and all that. And then, then when I I was called over and I says, you know, you got, you know, can you help me with, you know, this stuff? Because there was another part part wore out in there too that, you know, he claims he had seen, but he never mentioned it until when we went back into the second time. You know what I'm saying? And we were looking at it together. Uh, but anyway, one way or another, that's what that uh, looks like. This is what's applied. Right there. So if you're going from first to second, you got a problem. Right there in that part, that's the piece right in the middle uh, that, that, you know, that it was messed up that I was talking about right there. Uh, and, you know, you can look at all this stuff as much as you want to. Um, so right here, what's that mean? 
What's my mean? Right there. Where it says my, what does that mean? Hmm? Is your converter clutch? And I think you probably find this on his phone since he's married to it. But what we can do, if you've got a converter clutch, is it always locked in solid all the time on the newer model vehicles? Whenever your converter clutch engages, does it just lock in or what? Or does it? You look at your scan tool, you're going to see 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, and then it finally gets completely locked up at 100%. And whenever it doesn't have the friction modifier in the fluid, you're going to either feel a chatter. Have you ever you feel some of these Crown Victorias when a friction modifier begins to wear out in the fluid? Uh, what will happen is it'll actually feel like you're running over those little speed breakers coming into a stop sign. It'll go brrrr. And all you really have to do to fix that is just service the transmission, typically. You know, it's a good idea to do a full fluid exchange if you can. But anyway, modulate it. See, your converter clutch and your little reverse are modulated. All right. And then rinse them out here. We got that solenoid is energized on that one. And then you have your overdrive solenoid is energized. And so you can see where the fluid's changing position going in there. It's doing things. And now it's got underdrive and overdrive, which is your 3 4 and it's moving in along there. There's your, those two little cell points there. And this stuff right here, like I say, it's, it's really, really good to be able to track this down. Now, a lot of the times, you know, we have a notion of just, we're going to fly into this thing, we'll tear it down, we're going to see what we see broken, then we're going to fix it, and we're going to put it back together. <laughs> I mean, I've seen professional transmission guys get in trouble like that, you know, because they'll go in there and there'll be a, you know, without analyzing it enough, they'll go in there and there'll actually be a drum that's cracked that you can't see until pressure goes in there too bad. Uh, but basically, what are we in now? We're in direct here with a torque converter clutch energized. All right, and there's your torque converter clutch. And here we go. You got your fluid going up here. It's got still got those same two going on, except your torque converter clutch is on. In other words, you're in the same gear uh, in the previous slide, but your torque converter wasn't energized. That's what the whole deal was. And here's your overdrive. And once again, what's the difference between overdrive and regular drive? Drive shaft spinning faster than another. That's a good way to put that. The drive shaft spinning faster than the engine. What's that for? High speeds. Well, it's not just for high speed, it's for better gas miles. You know, if your engine drops down and it's only turning about 1200 or 1100 RPM, you know, then you're basically not going to be burning as much gas. This one friend of mine that I was talking to the other day says, if I put my car in neutral and coast down the hill so that the RPM drops off, am I saving gas? What would you tell him? If you go going downhill and you could and your motor's not spinning as fast as it is, so Well, what if I told you that you'll burn more gas doing that? If you put it in neutral and let it idle, when you let off and you got engine braking and the, and the transmission's driving the engine up higher, what does the fuel do? The computer shuts off the fuel injector because it doesn't need to add fuel then. But yeah, your engine's turning faster, but there's no fuel going in there. If you could watch a fuel injector, they would totally shut off. And there's no fuel going in there. So I told him if you let if you let the engine braking pull the engine speed up, you know, then basically you're not going to have any fuel going in there anyway. Because that's basically when you let off, why do they need fuel? So the engineer sets it up so, you know, the algorithm is set up so that it'll shut the injectors off. And um, if, the, if the calculated pulse width is low and the speed is high, then they shut them off because they don't need fuel. Over, underdrive and overdrive solenoids are energized in this little thing here. All right. And finally, we got overdrive. And, uh, somebody tell me what the EMCC is. Okay. Modulated converter clutch. Right? Electronically modulated converter clutch. All right. And that's converter clutch on. Did you notice the difference between those two up there at the converter? See? The fluid is not as. Uh, heavy up there. It's going up there, but it's not as strong. It's going to lose pressure. All right. There we go. And here's how the wiring is done. Right. This is sort of an overview of the wiring. Chrysler likes to do their wiring schematics like this. I've looked at some of the Dodge diesels, you know, whenever I was teaching classes on that. And you got output speed sensor, input speed sensor. That's those two plastic sensors on the side of the transmission. They also are on the side of the, uh, on some of these Dodges. Those little plastic sensors don't cost about $30. They like to die. And they'll keep it from shifting and stuff like that. Um, okay, you got a fused ignition switch. Now watch this. This is pretty important. 
if that's you that blows, what do you think? What's it what happens then? What's it going to? It's going to the fuse ignition switch input to the transmission range sensor. You know that they won't shift. There's another one. Look at that one. This is the transmission control module. Not only that, it's going to take off in high gear, right? So if you got one taking off in high gear and, and all that, then, then it's not a bad idea. And this here is one of you call that. What you can do, or if you got a transmission control relay problem, uh, if it's taking off in high gear, check fuses. Be terrible to have to go in there and get your hands all breezy if you could just change a fuse because of whatever reason. Sometimes fuses get tired and blow, sometimes they blow for another reason. There's your transmission range sensor. What do you know about this from looking at it? What type can a transmission range sensor is this? Is this analog or digital? Analog. What? How do you know it's analog? If it's got four switches, it's digital. And they're closed in various different configurations during the. And there's a, there's worksheets on this, guys, where you're supposed to actually go and plug the scan tool into the Crown Vic, or put the well actually put the breakout box on the Ranger, and find those four pins and do the math on that binary math digital part of that. I think one of you guys have already gone through with that. I don't remember who it was. And, uh, but that's what your transmission range sensor looks like. See all those pins in there? When you see those pins, you kind of need to know what they are. It's really important to know what they do. There's your pressure switches in that pack right there. Uh, low reverse pressure switch, 2-4 pressure switch. They're basically built in with the same thing except the solenoids in there. And then you got your solenoids in there. They're in the same pack. Two, four, low reverse, 2-4 underdrive solenoid, overdrive solenoid. Transmission control module is driving those. Sometimes the PCM does this depending on the vehicle. There's somebody that's coming in going over there. Oh, that's Daniel. Okay. And it was upgraded as a run and change this thing here from the two, for the 2000 model year. Fewer internal parts, no separator plate. It used to make a lot of noise, but they, the newer one, when they made it work to be quieter. These speed sensors, these plastic ones I was talking about, they don't cost very much, they're not very hard to change. I mean, somebody might have got mad at me about it, but this girl uh, emailed me one time through my website, and she says, uh, they're on $300 to change these two sensors into our transmission, you know. Goodness gracious, you know, we got to pay them that much to do that. And I said, well, I sent her a picture of where they were, and I said, here they are, and uh, you can buy them at the parts store. And so she emailed me back, and she said, those sensors cost $30 a piece, and me and my boyfriend did it, and it didn't, <laughs> it didn't take 30 minutes. I mean, you know what I'm saying, but I guess... You know, you charge whatever you can get away with. I don't know, like you charge whatever the market will bear. Uh, I never like doing that kind of thing. But uh, here's two piece differential design, provides strength and lubrication of the differential gears across you. And there, that's the last place the power goes before it leaves the transmission. This is a sort of a flying overview, but you can kind of understand how knowing those fluid tracks and all that kind of stuff will help you know where to look when you tear the transmission down. You see where I'm going with that? So, anybody any questions about this? You want to launch a discussion that we could get into for another 30 minutes or so? Okay, see him looking at the clock when I said that? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll let you guys go to lunch.